welcome to the Sedona Community Forum Online. This program is sponsored by OLLI, the Osher Lifelong Learning Institute in Sedona and Verde Valley, which is a program of the Lifelong Learning Division of Yavapai College. We'll switch our focus now to Sedona City Manager Justin Clifton. In our council manager form of government, the city manager appointed by the mayor and city council reports to those officials, carries out their policies, and oversees the activities of his executive team which includes several department heads, including the police chief, magistrate, city clerk, directors of the communications, community development, economic development, public works, financial services, human resources, information technology, parks and recreation, and wastewater departments. Whew, Justin, you have quite a full plate at work during the best of times. How has your work been influenced by this pandemic? Thanks very much for the lead in. Uh, it's interesting times to say the least. Uh, this is what in the emergency management business we call a low probability but high consequence event. They don't happen very often, but there's a lot at stake. Um, so interestingly, we don't have opportunities to plan very specific level planning for this type of a situation. We do have opportunities and we take advantage of opportunities to prepare generally for this kind of thing. Uh, and so I'm grateful that in my experience so far, I've done some of that. So for instance, um, maybe eight, 10 years ago, we were doing planning uh, around a pandemic actually, uh, swine flu and bird flu and, and those kind of things and had gotten to go through some good tabletop exercises that were very specific to a rapidly changing pandemic. Um, that exercise has proven really useful. It took eight or 10 years to become really relevant, um, but I'm able to call back to those lessons. Uh, similarly, we've done a lot across the staff, myself included, to prepare generally incident command systems training, um, homeland security type and FEMA type training. So those are all helping right now, but there's just nothing you can do to truly prepare. So to put this in a little bit of perspective, uh, our normal work is, is slow going. The mayor likes to say the, that local government moves at the pace of a narcoleptic snail. Well, that's, that's kind of true and it's true by design, especially because we are uh, so democratic in our process and we wanna remain open to input throughout planning and implementation phases. So for context with something like traffic improvements, people have been talking about traffic in Sedona for decades, right? Um, as recently as the last community plan, 2014, we put a fine point on that and said, we want to improve traffic flow. Then we completed a transportation master plan, which took a couple of years. Then we started to prioritize projects. And just now, 2020, we're getting ready to complete our first of those projects, okay? So six years. Now I'll take you back to about a month ago today, uh, the 15th of March. Uh, that weekend was pretty normal. We started to hear word that uh, schools were considering closing, especially in the Phoenix area and other states, especially Washington and California that had some hot spots for COVID-19 were also starting to take action. But it was really unclear just 30 days ago what was going to happen locally. So I recall actually on a Sunday, uh, March 15th, I was at a, out at a local trailhead. I got a call right before I went out on my little run from the Coconino County manager and just kind of, hey, we want to check in. Um, we know there's some things going on in the state. Everything appears normal so far. Haven't heard anything relative to our local schools closing. And, and it was a fairly normal check-in call. Um, I get back from a, a little run an hour later and schools had already closed. Within 24 or 48 hours, all schools across the state had closed. So I found myself at work Monday morning, the 16th, thinking, okay, something's going on and it's going, it's happening really fast. So what will we do? Uh, the driver of this, of course, was the early days of social distancing. Uh, initially, that guidance was avoiding crowds of 50. It soon became avoiding crowds of 10. And so as I started to think about our local operations, I thought, well, here at City Hall campus, we have a, a, a large number of employees. I haven't, I haven't done the count, but out of the 140 or so we have, I, I'd venture to say two thirds of them are better, are, are located at least some portion of the day at City Hall. And then we have a lot of public coming in to do business. So what does this social distancing mean for us? And what do we do now that we know that schools have closed, knowing that at least some of our employees are now without the childcare that they rely on that enables them to go to work? 
So really quickly, we had to start thinking in a very different way, not the years and years of planning and design phase and implementation phase, but what do we do tomorrow? So I had already started to think that we needed to close our offices by that Monday. But of course, we're all looking around at each other. So I start an email listserv with uh, uh, my Verde Valley County counterparts right away, saying, what are you guys thinking? Uh, I'm talking to Coconino County and Yavapai County, asking them if they're planning closures. Um, I think by the Tuesday, I might be a little off on my dates because it, it happened hour by hour, but virtually the next day, Flagstaff was one of the first communities to declare an emergency and start to take action to restrict businesses. So within 24 hours, we're making the decision to close city operations, to work remotely. And by the way, we're, we're somewhat set up for that. I'm at home on a laptop and we've converted a lot of the organizations to laptops so that they can work remotely. But not everybody is in that situation and it doesn't work for all services. So within about a day, we're working with our team to decide what services are we gonna cancel altogether? What services are we gonna maintain in some sort of a remote environment? And what essential services need to continue pretty much in the same fashion that they existed before this whole thing started? Police services, wastewater services, general maintenance, you know, the trash can is still gonna get full. Someone's still gonna wanna use the public restroom. So we went right into that planning and, and I'm proud of our team that by Wednesday morning, we had a plan, we had implemented the closure, we had created a list of our services and those that would be canceled altogether, those that would be provided on some sort of an amended um, service basis, things like development services, um, not really essential like police, but frankly, if someone's got a construction loan to build a home and they can't get a permit, that's a pretty big deal. So we've tried our best to maintain those kinds of things by appointment and, and just reorganize the way we do work quickly. Um, our IT staff, uh, the first day of closure, asked me, should we go ahead and buy 10 new laptops? It'll take us at least two weeks. And to be honest, at that time, it's, it's hard to remember now, but at that time, we were thinking this could be over in two weeks. But uh, throughout a situation like this, leaning on my uh, training and experience in these kinds of situations, although nothing quite like this one, I said, let's err on the side of being cautious. Let's prepare as thoroughly as we can. If it turns out we were overprepared, that's a nice problem to have. And so we immediately went into things like, let's buy some new laptops. Let's start to build our capacity, assuming that this situation might last longer than what people are currently anticipating. And in fact, it, it has, and that's really enabled us to be more productive and effective. So that, that really condensed time frame trying to take something that would be done in weeks or months or years and start to make decisions in hours or days is really the backdrop for almost everything that's gone on since those early days of this pandemic. So uh, the mayor and I were talking and as she noted in her conversation, we really arrived at the same conclusion right about the same time. I had written an elaborate email to all of council to say, council, um, this is my advice as a professional who's seen things like this, nothing quite, you know, exactly parallel, but certainly case studies of hurricanes and floods and, and, and other things. And my general summary of that circumstance was, we could be wrong either way, but how would we prefer to be wrong? What are the consequences of being wrong because we acted too swiftly, um, our actions were too decisive, maybe you know more than what was actually needed, or would we rather be wrong the other way, where we didn't do everything we could? and something tragic happened, and then we had to face the fact that we could have made another decision. And not to minimize at all the economic side of this, because that economic side is health. It is safety. It's people's incomes that, that, that they need to feed their families. It's people that have put their entire lives into their small businesses and risk losing it forever and never getting it back and not having another kind of social uh, safety net to really replace um, what they invested their life savings in. So, so the stakes were really high. Again, we kind of talked early on about um, low probability, but high consequence. Um, these were high consequence decisions that we had to make right away. And it was quite apparent that we were a little more eager, if you will, to act than some of our counterparts. And, and I'll be honest, what, what that 
feels like, even though it was largely the mayor's decision in terms of uh, the, the, the declaration of emergency, I mean, that was entirely her choice, but things like closing the office and moving forward in the direction we did when very few other communities in Arizona were, were doing the same, you know, felt like my neck was getting longer, right? Um, and certainly we heard from people. Needless to say that the decisions that we had to make were very high consequence. Um, a lot was at stake and we were hearing from people about how important that was. Um, but we acted quickly in those early days. Uh, from there, what was really helpful is the kind of collaboration and information we were getting was very quick. Uh, Coconino County especially was really early in organizing. It's really important to note that our system of federalism as beautiful as it is, a lot of local control has some unintended consequences, maybe even intended consequences. One of those is we have all of these layers of jurisdictions. So we've got the federal government, we've got the state, but that, that really just scratches the surface because locally we're a small town in two counties and we've got things like a separately governed fire department. So there's really a lot to coordinate um, between all of these separate entities, some of whom were at different stages of planning. So Coconino County was out of the gate early. They, they brought their uh, emergency operations center online. Uh, we had on-site meetings, the first one, right? How silly does that sound now? Right before we closed everything down, we drove up to Coconino County and sat in a room with 30 or 40 people and had a meeting about a pandemic. Uh, but those were the early lessons we learned. Nevertheless, um, we appreciated that in that environment, we had context to experts, uh, context from experts and, and, and contact with them. Um, statutorily speaking, the way, the way the state is set up, counties have a mandate for health and human services and emergency management. And they cover those topics and cities typically don't because those things tend to transcend small local jurisdictions. You're generally not going to manage an emergency that is contained wholly within a city or town. So that's one of the reasons counties really have more responsibility in a situation like this than we do. So they have epidemiologists on staff and we had access to epidemiologists. Um, we had access to people who had planned uh, for nat national uh, natural disasters and those kinds of things. Uh, so we, we gleaned a lot from them. On those calls were schools, other healthcare providers, um, fire departments, other police departments, other policy experts. So we really relied heavily on the information we were getting. But at the end of the day, while everybody was more or less on the same page over weeks, day to day, we really weren't. Day to day, the Verde Valley was a little more leaning toward the economy, as Ernie had described it earlier, opposed to erring on the side of caution and, and imposing restrictions. So we had to proceed um, even without knowing that we were doing what everybody else was doing. So, you know, our staffing is a little different. Our resources are different. Where we're fortunate is that we've been well set up with IT kinds of uh, equipment and resources. We've got a really talented and eager team. So they jumped right in to jobs that they're not even familiar with um, to, to, to help respond to this pandemic. Immediately in the first couple of days, we had team members reaching out to uh, agencies in the area, food banks, you know, uh, people that might be providing uh, rental assistance, shelter for people that don't have it, asking, do you need help? And, and so we, we got plugged in right away, created a resource list. As the mayor said, we put everything on our website. We were really active in trying to push out information. We set up a special email right away, knowing that we needed a clearinghouse and, and a unified message. Um, I've actually been monitoring that email since day one, uh, seven days a week, so that I know the message is consistent. You know, I've written a response to each one, so there was no room for error in, in not quite being on the same page. So we, we've got great resources, but again, our mandate is a little different. So we were focused a little more on, you know, what do we do locally? How do we keep up with operations? Somewhere along the way, we had room to do a little more uh, at the local level. So for instance, when the Forest Service engaged the city and said, we see situations where people are not really practicing the physical distancing they should. Devil's Bridge. Everybody wants to get on top of Devil's Bridge and take a picture. So they line up 40 people deep and they take turns walking out so that no one else is in the frame and taking their picture. 
Well, <laughs> that's not social distancing. And, and people can't help themselves because they've gone out of their way for that one picture and, and darn it, they're gonna get it. So it became apparent that some of those sites really needed to be closed. The Forest Service was willing to do that. The mayor and I expressed support for doing that if it was related to um, keeping people healthy. But we knew that that might have other kinds of consequences. Would people go to neighborhood trailheads? Um, how would it affect areas like Soldiers Pass where we already have overflow parking problems? So again, in another instance of quick action, our team got together and within about 24 hours, figured out how to send some of our team members out to trailheads, not just the ones that were closed, but the ones that were left open to monitor impacts, to deliver a message about the governor's uh, stay home order, um, to question people about whether their travel was essential or non-essential. If someone said, oh, we came up from Tucson to hike, our team had the green light to say, I, I wonder if that's consistent with the, the no essential travel. I mean, you've got areas to recreate in Tucson, don't you? You know, we tried not to be too aggressive and, and put words into the governor's mouth. Uh, he's been clear that that those activities are still designated as essential and he's not given a further clarification that that should be avoided. So we didn't wanna to go too far in that, but we wanted to do everything we could to protect our community by still suggesting to people, take that stay home order seriously. Take the no non-essential travel portion of that order seriously and, and maybe question whether driving across the state to recreate is, is a good idea. So that was another example of, of collaboration and deploying our resources. Um, and and I'll, I'll kind of summarize some of the last of this just by painting a picture of a, of a day in the life. Um, this has impacted people in so many ways. We, we, we've even had um, team members, one in particular, um, who, who passed away during this situation. And that individual's family can't convene for a service. We, we have team members who have family that have contracted the virus, some that are in hospitals in, in other states and, and team members can't go visit them. Um, we've seen the other side, which is the stress. And we've heard anecdotes again from team members referencing their direct families, things like depression, suicide, actual suicide. And so the calls from local businesses, people that tell these heartfelt stories about how they invested everything into our community to open a business, to fulfill a lifelong dream. And they're telling us, maybe I can go another week or two, maybe a month, but we fear we're gonna lose it all. And then of course we hear from the people saying, I'm afraid to leave my house, I need to leave to go out and get exercise, but I see people with out-of-state license plates from places like California, where we know there are hot spots for COVID-19. Uh, we don't understand why the hotels are still open or the vacation rental next to me is, is still uh, having people come in. Um, so, so this is just a high stress time for everybody. I've done my best as an individual, number one, to protect myself and to ensure my own mental health. Um, my day, seven to six is different. And, and maybe I don't even have quite as many things to do seven to six as I did before. But I also haven't had a day off since this started and I don't expect I will for a while. And if I get an email on Sunday night and it's somebody panic stricken that needs information, I'm gonna stop what I'm doing and I'm gonna reply to that person and give them the information they need. So, so I'm doing my best to protect you know, myself and ensure my own mental health, reaching out to our team, uh, to let them know that, that we're supporting them. Talking about big decisions, one of the big ones that we made early on was to keep people on payroll. Um, you know, we're, we're going to lose, I, I don't know how many, millions, but millions of dollars, probably double digit millions, more than 10 million. Um, so there's consequences to continuing to pay people, including the ones that don't necessarily have as much work to do as they used to. But the last thing we need is another person in the unemployment line, right? I don't know if we're gonna get reimbursed for all of those costs or not, but we had to make a decision. It had to be quick. And, and I still have confidence that that's the right thing to do. So we continue to make those on a daily basis, try to support each other as a team, try to support the community and assure them that we're working hard 
even though sometimes we can't give them the information that they really want. We can't assure them everybody will get a test. We can't assure them the hospital ICU units will be adequate to take care of the surge. Everybody is planning those things, talking about those things. We're all on the job. But in these unprecedented times, one of the most difficult things is not having answers that people really want or need and having to fall back on, we will keep trying, which only goes so far to comfort somebody who's really um, in, in dire straits. So moving forward, I, I think we're going to have a lot more of this collaboration. Um, things have stabilized a little bit, but as the mayor suggested, if tomorrow there's a, a, a new surge of cases that we didn't anticipate, we may need to react. Uh, if there's a marketing campaign out there from a, a private hotel to bring people in from Colorado, a state that has said, do not go to the mountains. Outdoor recreation means walk around your block, not go camping. Um, you know, we might have to adjust to those things. So the next, you know, every day is, is interesting in that regard. You know, we hear about a new antibody test and then I, I read something about, you know, maybe there are flaws in that test. Same thing about the rapid test, right? And that's one of the reasons I emphasized earlier on not to count on something like a Walgreens test. You know, the, the counties have intended to stand up drive-through tests and then later figured out that they didn't have uh, enough of the samples to do so. In some cases it's happened, in some cases it hasn't. It's, it's really been day to day. And, and then long-term, um, we're already starting to think, what do we do to cover the losses? You know, the, the, the really serious decline in revenue. Um, what do we do long term when even if we open back up the economy and it appears safe to do so, we can't anticipate the level of confidence people will have in that economy. Will people be willing to travel? Will they be willing to go and sit down at a restaurant even after a time when somebody says it's okay? And by the way, for every one person that says okay, I can virtually assure you there'll be somebody else saying, no, no, it's not okay yet. Don't listen to them. So, so there's a lot of those things long-term that we can't predict yet, but we're starting to think about that. We always need to have one foot in that kind of long-term thinking um, door. You know, keep that wedged open so we're not losing sight of what is just beyond uh, today and, and, and the end of the week. So, so we keep doing that. Um, and then the really important thing, of course, the mayor mentioned it, uh, everybody wants nuanced information, right? They want to know, is it in my neighborhood? Or can I get it because uh, somebody passed me on a trail and they were breathing hard and exhaling and I know that this virus can live in the air? Am I at risk? You know, they want all of that. If the community needs to know one thing and one thing only, it's presumed COVID-19 is widespread and act accordingly. Stay home as much as you can stay home. If you have to go out, practice physical distancing, disinfect, practice hygiene, wash your hands, be cognizant of things like, you know, you've all seen on social media, people putting on their gloves and then going grocery shopping and then driving in the same gloves and then touching their face. Um, you know, it just takes a little focus and, and kind of um, vigilant behavior right now even though we can't see it in front of us all the time to really take that seriously. And if you knew nothing else, but, but, but that message, stay home, stay safe, stay connected, wash your hands, do all those things. Um, like, like all the other terrible things that occasionally happen in the world, this too shall pass. So I'm happy to answer any questions. Thank you. Well, folks, we don't have much time left. So uh, if we could get in three quick questions, we'll, we'd love to have them. So uh, do any of you, are any of you ready to go? I did have a question. Uh, we have a lot of visitors come through Sedona every year. I, I've heard different numbers, but say 3 million. Uh, shutting down the restaurants and the bars and so forth has no doubt reduced that number. Uh, but telling someone who comes to stay in a hotel to stay at home is really not gonna be very effective. So the number of people we have coming through Sedona is really crucial, not only now, but going forward. And uh, as we open things up, I'm just wondering, do we have statistics on uh, how much the visitor count has gone down since we've uh, taken the actions that we have? We, we have some indicators, more than really hard data, because it is hard to count people coming in. Um, we use indicators. One of those is hotel occupancy. So in a month like uh, March and April, we would have total occupancy close to 90%. 
What that means is every weekend, you're probably 100% booked. And then during the week, you're even close to 100% booked to average out at about 90%. As we've engaged with hoteliers now, even by uh, the end of March before the stay home order, they were projecting occupancy of close to 30%. Um, you know, over those couple weeks where this was just emerging, and then occupancy closer to 10% moving forward. Numbers of entire hotels have just closed their doors voluntarily because that was the best thing to do. So of those that remain open, if their occupancy is close to 10%, across the board, it might be closer to something like five. We also use things like traffic congestion as an indicator, and those numbers also suggest, and that would capture day trippers and things, um, that, that we are a very small fraction of typical tourism. I would venture to say similar, 10% of normal, 15% of normal, something like that. Are you going to be using those kind of uh, indicators going forward as we open up things? Do you have some kind of plan on ramp up rate or, or limitation? Yeah, so what we don't have is the plan to say, here's what's first, second, and third, and here's the threshold or the criteria. But what we will do is continue to monitor all those key indicators that we have. Um, you stay connected with uh, our, our business community, stay connected with our, our, our individuals in the community and collect as much of that as we can. And, and we've also built models to try to project financial uh, implications of this. So the other thing we need those data for is if we assumed we're going to be, let's say, half of normal occupancy by this fall, does that actually happen or not? And if it doesn't, if it's more like 10% or a quarter, we need to revise our projections and anticipate greater loss in revenues and account for that too. So we'll, we'll be monitoring all of those indicators very closely and considering all of those whenever we make decisions. Anyone else? Yeah, I, I believe you're on mute. There. Okay, can you hear me now? Yes. Okay, yeah. first of all, thank you both to Sandy and Justin. The amount of collaboration is just amazing. And I think when people see this, the amount that's being done behind the scenes that we really haven't been aware of, they're really going to feel, I feel, more secure knowing that you have explored so many areas. So in that vein, as we look forward, are there some beneficial things that you might have done or seen that you would like to continue implementing or doing even as we ease up at some time? And what might some of those be? I, I could certainly share that on the operation side, um, nothing proves that we can work effectively remotely like having to work remotely. Yeah. And so I think we've figured out um, some new creative ways to deliver services. And I think that's actually pretty helpful. We've gotten good or, or at least better at things like having Zoom meetings uh, to collaborate. And, and one of our best retention mechanisms at the city has been some element of flexible scheduling. 80% of our workforce lives outside of Sedona. So being able to accommodate them to be productive and, and still have some flexibility to work from home or to do some other things remotely um, has been really, really good for us. And, and I think we've learned some things on the communication side too. Um, thing early on, setting up a special email, you know, for, for this one topic has proven to be really effective. And I think we would continue to do those kinds of things in an effort, you know, with normal communication, um, not in such an emergency environment, but a as an effective way to really consolidate topics um, and enable people to engage in a way that's a little different than they have historically. So those are a couple things that stand out to me. I was just thinking, uh, given your extensive uh, training, Justin, is there, can you see anything coming up on the horizon that we need to look forward to doing? Uh, yes. So always in these situations, I think we look back and say you can never do too much training. So the city has a disaster um, preparedness plan. And it actually has a chapter on pandemics, believe it or not. So um, one of the things we'll do at the end of this is go back and revise that chapter and say, what, what was missing from this that we've learned since? Um, in the very early days of this pandemic, I asked our entire leadership team to refresh on 
incident command systems training that's available um, through the web so that we just remember what it looks like to implement that kind of an emergency management protocol. Our team had already done that in the last 12 to 18 months, you know, because being prepared is important, but we asked them to do it again. Um, I think after this, we will again take those kind of exercises even more seriously. One of the areas we had not really um, done as much as we needed to is in an area called continuity of operations. And that's the side of emergency management planning that says, how do you continue to provide services if you have a fire at your facility? Or if by natural disaster or some other reason, you don't have access to a building or a computer or you know, equipment or whatever. Um, we hadn't finished those plans, so we were kind of flying blind to continue our operations uh, remotely. Well, we'll have a renewed sense of urgency to uh, tighten those plans up to make sure that next time we could act quicker, um, we would have fewer stumbles. Um, I'm proud of what our team did, don't get me wrong, but there's always room for improvement. So um, we'll do a lot of after in situation kind of planning to tighten this whole thing up. Well, thank you, Justin. Uh, we've just about run out of time. So I uh, need to thank our guests of honor today, Justin Clifton, Sedona's city manager. We're so grateful for the frank and thoughtful glimpses you gave us into the workings of city government during this very challenging period. It's inspiring to know how flexibly and capably you're adapting your efforts to the new demands you're facing. We're all very grateful for your contributions to navigating Sedona's civic life as we travel through this unprecedented episode. Take care, be well, stay home.